if you watch the news every night, you're not going to see a headline every night or read a headline in a newspaper every day that, you know, uh, 400 people died yesterday of cancer. You're just not going to see that. Uh, it, it doesn't make news because it happens all the time. But if one person was killed by a terrorist somewhere in the United States, in uh, Wyoming or something, um, that would be a headline news everywhere. So people get afraid when they see, uh, it's called fear-mongering or terror-mongering, when they, uh, the spotlight is put on small instances of, of uh, terrorism. You know, George Bush only had one drone attack in Yemen in eight years. Eight years, it was one drone attack. Barack Obama has had about three a week ever since he took office. He's created this new war on the world with drones. Now in Yemen, there were th about 300 members of Al-Qaeda of the Arabian Peninsula um, when he took office. Um, now there's about 3,000. That doesn't sound like a very good success story. If, if you got 10 times more terrorists than when you started out, to me, that says your policy is sort of wrong. And it's because if you kill a terrorist and you kill three members of his family, okay, you got one dead terrorist, but now you got probably 10 more people that are gonna become terrorists because you killed members of their family. So th the math doesn't work. It's a liberal domestic policy and a, um, um, you know, George Bush on steroid uh, foreign policy. You know, ISIS grew out of of uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq. There was no Al-Qaeda in Iraq before we invaded Iraq. So we're our own worst enemy. You know, it's really time to let the Middle East sort of solve their own problems and let us cure the world of cancer, Ebola, uh, AIDS, a few other problems. I mean, how many, how many, how many terrorists are going to start blowing up our buildings if we start curing cancer instead of blowing up Middle Eastern countries? We could be an empire for good instead of an empire for bad. All right, Young and Eve, we're still um, at the CCC, 31st, and who are you? James Bamford. What do you do, James? Uh, I'm a writer and a journalist, a television producer. And you, 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 you for what? I was here to give a talk on uh, sort of the history of NSA's secret cooperation with the telecom companies. I've been writing about NSA for 30 years or so. My uh, first book came out in 1982, so I've been uh, writing about NSA probably longer and more than anybody else at this point. Is um, the NSA a great agency or the greatest? I don't think it's either. I think it's an agency that's uh, far overrated, receives far too much money for what they do. Uh, they're very good at doing normal intelligence, which is finding out what the North Koreans are doing or finding out what the Russians or the Chinese are doing. The problem is, instead of doing that, um, they've been turning their ears, their eavesdropping equipment on the American public. and. Uh, um, Two bad results of that is that Americans lose their privacy, and the second bad result is that uh, they aren't able to f figure out where the terrorists are. What about the privacy of Russians and Chinese and Germans? Well, and Germans are, uh, are allies. I don't, you know, I'm not in favor of the uh, NSA eavesdropping on civilians, but I don't have any problem with them eavesdropping on the Chinese or the Russian or the North Korean military and finding out what they're doing. That's what spy organizations are supposed to do instead of spying on their own citizens. So they don't do that anymore or do they do more? Of what? Spying, like uh, eave eavesdropping. Well, they've been doing more. I mean, ever since 9-11, they've been give, uh, given billions and billions of dollars to um, increase their size, increase their numbers of people, increase the amount of technology, increase their amount of spying. Problem is, a lot of it is being turned on the American public, and the uh, American public didn't know about it until the revelations of uh, Edward Snowden. Well, now they know, and it's still in place. It's still going on. It's the way it's been going on for years. Uh, I mentioned in my talk, the NSA has been spying for almost 100 years uh, now. and uh, 100 or years? Well, it, it began with an organization called the Black Chamber in 1920, and it's 
changed its name a number of times, but it's basically the same organization has been going on for almost 100 years, and they've been doing illegal domestic spying for almost 100 years. What's the point of domestic illegal spying or domestic spying? Well, what the NSA will say is that we're looking for terrorists. Uh, and uh, the problem is they've never been able to find any terrorists in the United States. So, um, But they keep looking. And they keep spending lots of money, and they keep invading a lot of privacy, hoping one day they'll find a terrorist. The problem is there are very, very few terrorists. Um, the number of people killed by terrorists, I think, la last year was, was about average. It's about six people in the United States. Um, is that a lot? It's about as small a number as you can get. There's probably more people that die from coconuts falling on their heads. There were actually 24 people that died from dog bites last year. Um, but we aren't spending billions of dollars to rein in dogs. Um, the war on dogs. Right. Uh, I mean, you can... Uh, people slip on bathtubs. You know, more people slip on bathtubs and die than, uh, than die from terrorists in the United States. So does that mean uh, we, we start um, creating bath police or whatever? Uh, you know, this, it's, it's crazy, but... Maybe, maybe we should. Um, no, I don't think so. But I think the NSA is so overrated with... Uh, with uh, it's not overrated. The fact is that the American public is um, subjected to all this fear-mongering. You know, the, we've got to do this or the terrorists will get us, the Taliban will get us, or ISIS will get us, or... Al Qaeda will get us, or whatever. Um, and in reality, there are a lot of dangers in the U.S., but dangers in the U.S. of dying from terrorism isn't one of them. Well, what are you afraid afraid of? I actually am afraid of uh, some terrorists. They're 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 all around, actually. And the problem is, you can only see them through a microscope. They're called cancer cells, huh. uh, and they're the ones that really do kill people. I mean, how many people know other people who have died of, from a terrorist attack, and how many people know people who have died from cancer? It's just the, that's how people die. They die from cancer, they die from uh, heart disease, they die from car accidents, they gar die from gun violence. Um, but the money is going to these agencies for uh, stopping terrorism and, and uh, not going to the National Institutes of Health to prevent cancer. It doesn't make any sense to me, um, but that's the way it is in the United States. But, but if it doesn't make sense, why do they still keep doing that? Well, because if you watch the news every night, you're not going to see a headline every night or read a headline in a newspaper every day that, you know, uh, 400 people died yesterday of cancer. You're just not going to see that. Uh, it, it doesn't make news because it happens all the time. But if one person was killed by a terrorist somewhere in the United States, in uh, Wyoming or something. Um, and that would be a headline news everywhere. So people get afraid when they see, uh, it's called fear-mongering or terror-mongering, when they, uh, the spotlight is put on small instances of, of uh, terrorism, and that creates a large fear when the real fears are, are things that, People don't see the, they don't see the, you know, the, 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 the hearses carrying people to the cemetery from cancer. They just see a, a blood splattered lobby where some, somebody got shot or whatever. I mean, the irony here is that most people who die of violence in the United States don't die from terrorism. They die from handguns that uh, people have, a robbery at a, at a uh, convenience store or something like that. So we have almost 30,000 people a year that die from uh, gun violence. Yet there's almost no laws preventing people from buying guns. You can buy as many guns as you want. It's, it's a crazy thing. People, uh, very few people, uh, extremely low numbers of people die from terrorism in the United States. You've got all this, you've got to take your shoes off, you got to do all these kind of crazy things uh, and spend all this money trying to track down terrorists when in reality, if we wanted to prevent deaths, just create some more laws preventing people to have uh, be able to buy 30 guns a month if they want or assault weapons. Maybe like in Germany, prevent them from getting guns at all. 
Well, I'm all for that. Um, I'm all for banning the manufacturer, the sale, or the possession of guns. Um, so it's, uh, it's to get rid of the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment, if if you can read it two different ways. The way the gun advocates read it is that everybody should have a right to a gun. But what it says in the Second Amendment is militia, militia, a well-armed militia. It doesn't say everybody on earth can have, have a gun. It says a well-armed militia. That is means, it, uh, that it, means uh, the National Guard or whatever. So um, um, besides, you don't have to take everything literally. Um, you know, they wrote on horses back in those days. Uh, does that mean uh, the, the laws that apply to horses, we've got to apply to cars? It doesn't make any sense. You have to adopt... Uh, for the changing of the times, and um, if if you look at the, compare the uh, the ratio of people that die from gun violence in the United States to um, the UK or Germany or Japan or any other industrialized country, it's absurd that we we uh, we have so many gun deaths. You have people walk into schools that shoot a dozen people. I mean. And, and the you know some twelve year old kid gets a hold of guns because his father has five guns and he doesn't lock them up. I mean the whole thing is crazy. But but you know the big threat is terrorism when we should be paying attention to curing cancer, or stopping gun violence, and things like that. But why is uh, the American media, the American public, not more afraid of school shootings, of cancer, than of terrorism? You know, if I had an answer to that, I'd be a world-renowned psychologist. I have no idea. Uh, you know, my job is to write about what's happening, not be able to understand why they're doing it. Um, again, I think the, the, the key reason is because of uh, uh, a number of factors. One of them is that people fear terrorism because they uh, it, it's so visual when you see it. You see blood splattered everywhere. And it gets uh, the attention um, of the press because it's terrorism. So you get some editors say, you know, five people might have been killed in, uh, in um, uh, you know, some shootout at a, uh, at a uh, convenience store. But if somebody uh, uh, gets shot at an airport, uh, you know, because they start screaming they're going to blow up a plane, then all of a sudden that's like national news for a week. So people start, I, I'm not going to get on a plane, you know, the terror is everywhere. But it's this visual thing where you see it and psychologically you think it's everywhere, when in reality it's so isolated um, and the real dangers are the things you don't see, the cancer, the heart disease, the gun violence and so forth. And those are the things that will probably kill you. I mean... Like the U.S. president, Mr. Obama, he's he's a smart man. Doesn't doesn't he know that? But what, what, why isn't he the first guy who says, "Stop fucking around, you guys"? Uh, terrorism isn't that isn't that important? Isn't that relevant? Isn't that uh, you, you shouldn't be afraid of that? You should be afraid of cancer and uh, 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 normal violence. What, what, why doesn't the U.S. president is the why isn't he the? He should have said that. He should have said exactly that in his inaugural address. He would have been a one-term president. Really? He wouldn't have gotten elected again because the right wing would have said, you're crazy and uh, you're ignoring terrorism and you're weak on terrorism and you're weak on the military and you're, you know, all the normal things. Is being weak on terrorism bad if terrorism doesn't even exist that much? No, I mean, I'm... Look, the, that's the problem. The problem is you get a president like uh, uh, Barack Obama, who I support a lot of other people because we thought he was going to be a change from George Bush. And what happens? He turns out to be a typical politician. He comes in office. His one goal in life, just one goal, is to get reelected. And the way you do that is you keep your base, the base being progressives who voted for him. So you give them domestic policy. You give them health care. You try, you know, health care. You do um, gay, gay rights. rights. All that stuff, you know, the, the typical progressive domestic agenda. But that's only going to get you maybe 47% of the vote or whatever. Um, but you need to get that other, you need to get what they call blue dog Democrats, conservative Democrats, and you need to get the sort of the right, some, uh, you know, the, the less crazy right. Um, so what you have to give them is you give them the foreign policy. You give them 
You, you, give, came, you give them? Yeah, you give them foreign policy. You give the, your supporters the domestic policy. You give the crazies the um, foreign policy. So he comes into office. He could have ended the war in Afghanistan in six months. It would have been easy. You just, okay, war's over. Everybody back. Um, he didn't. He increased, he tripled the number of forces in Afghanistan because he bought into what the generals were saying. Generals are always going to push for more troops. They're all, that's their job. That's what they do. The president's job is to, is to overrule them um, and to bring sanity to it. But he didn't. He followed the generals because that's what the, uh, the right and the Republicans were, were pushing for. Um, so he wouldn't get criticized. So he did that. Total failure. We've been, we're still in the longest war. It was the longest war when he came into office. Now it's still the longest war. Um, you know, George Bush only had one drone attack in Yemen in eight years. Eight years. It was one drone attack. Barack Obama has had about three a week ever since he took office. He's created this new war on the world with drones. Now in Yemen, there were about 300 members of Al-Qaeda of the Arabian Peninsula um, when he took office. Um, now there's about 3,000. That doesn't sound like a very good success story. If, if you got 10 times more terrorists than when you started out, to me that says your policy is sort of wrong. And it's because if you kill a terrorist and you kill three members of his family, okay, you got one dead terrorist, but now you got probably 10 more people that are going to become terrorists because you killed members of their family. So th the math doesn't work. Uh, uh, and, and yet he does it because when a Republican comes into office, or when a, sorry, when a Republican is running for president, they always go after the Democrat with, uh, for three major uh, faults. You're weak on the military, you're weak on terrorism, and you're weak on national security. So Barack Obama wanted to insulate himself uh, from that attack. He couldn't say he's weak on the military because he tripled the number of forces in Afghanistan. He couldn't say he's weak on terrorism because he's launched his whole new drone war all over the world, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Yemen, Somalia, and so forth. And they couldn't say he's weak on national security because he let the CIA and the NSA do whatever they want. I mean, they've been doing more eavesdropping than they did under uh, Bush. They, uh, he prosecuted nobody under terrorism, uh, conducted, it was a Congress, the Senate that did an investigation. The White House, the president, uh, the executive branch never did an investigation on terrorism. Uh, I mean, not terrorism, I'm sorry, torture. Um, the Congress investigated torture, but the uh, administration has never investigated torture. So it's this, this crazy, uh, bifurcation of, uh, of policies, a liberal domestic policy and a, um, um, you know, George Bush on steroid uh, foreign policy. I mean, you said uh, the goal of a president is get reelected. Right. Um, That's the goal of his. Uh, that was his goal. I'm, uh, you know, my ideal president would be a president who comes in and says, okay, um, it's time for a reality check. And say, these are the numbers in terms of terrorism. These are the numbers in terms of cancer. These are the numbers in terms of gun violence. I'm going to put my effort where it deserves my effort and, and then go from there. I mean... You're going to have people that are going to go crazy um, because you're not, you know, you're you're not going along with the the lobbies and you're not going along with the, uh, you know, the industrial military complex and all that. Um, so you'd probably be a one-term president. But wh why is that so bad? You know, another alternative is to create a, a six-year one-term president. So presidents don't have to um, worry about re-election. And they have six years instead of four to, to do it. You're going to still have presidents who are going to worry about midterm elections every two years. And see, that's what you can see Barack Obama doing that. I mean, what happened in Cuba could have happened a year ago, right. two years ago. Right. Uh, all the pieces have been in place for years or basically decades. Um, 
but he waited until after the torture report. No, wait. He waited until after the the the, the last midterm election of his presidency. You know, they're every two years. Yeah. Uh, I think he was afraid to do it um, uh, until the last election um, during his term was over. It wasn't even his election. It was just Congress. But he didn't want to jeopardize the numbers of people being voted in on the Democratic side. Anyway, so you have a president waiting six years before he does what he's setting out to do. And even then, it's still kind of very modern. I mean, very, very moderate. I mean, how many people are going to be against him for ending a, a useless um, um, embargo on Cuba after 50 years? The only people that were for it in the first place are a handful of anti-Castro Cubans and uh, or anti-Castro former Cubans who have emigrated to the United States in Miami. I mean, they're you know, do we uh, do we uh, direct U.S. foreign policy because of uh, you know? A, 20,000 people in a country made up of uh, uh, 300 million. I mean, it doesn't make sense. Right. But, but I mean, as you said, now, now he's not going to be able to be reelected. He's not going to affect any more elections. Can't he now be like, like now give the speech you were talking about? Right. Uh, but he won't because he he's. Won't? No, I don't think. I think he'll he'll move closer to that. But I don't think he'll be as forceful as a lot of people like me and a lot of other progressives would, would like. Uh, I think he'll move a bit in that direction. That was Cuba. But then again, Cuba, I mean, uh, you're really only getting the hard... You know, Cuba is a really good uh, example of, of a policy that he should have done a long time ago because what it does is it shows the Republicans as being crazy because it forces them to come out and defend the policy That makes no sense. That hasn't made sense for 50 years. So now you've got uh, uh, politicians like a uh, uh, senator from Florida um, coming out and saying uh, uh, Obama shouldn't have done away with this uh, embargo and all that. It makes him look silly. It makes him look silly. So it would have been a safe policy years ago, but he just didn't do it. So, yeah, a lot of people would really like to see him coming out. Now the last election, except for his successor, is over. Now come out and, and be the Barack Obama they thought he was going to be when he came into office. But I just don't, um, I'll see, I see, can see him moving a bit in that direction, but, uh, but not much. I mean, where is he going to stop uh, um, going after journalists? Uh, Is he going to end the war in Afghanistan? Is he uh, going to bring all the troops home? Uh, he's still talking about leaving thousands of troops there and so forth. So, Why do you think he is not prosecuting um, people who ordered to torture? Like Dick Cheney? Yeah, I mean, they, these people should be prosecuted. They violated the law. There's an international agreement on international treaty that the United States signed on torture and everybody in the world agrees, even Barack Obama agrees that's torture. Why aren't, why, why aren't they being prosecuted? They aren't even being in, investigated right. or indicted, let alone prosecuted. So, um, and the people who carried it out. You know, we had the Nuremberg uh, trials in Germany after World War II where um, the, the main principle that came out of that is that uh, just because your boss or your general or your colonel orders you to do something doesn't mean you can do it. If, it, if it's a violation of law, that you, you're not covered just because somebody orders you to do it. So the people who actually carried out the torture should be prosecuted just as well as the, the people who ordered the torture. That's the only way you're ever going to stop um, bad activities by people in government is by punishing them. That's what you do with bank robbers. You know, you rob a bank. You shouldn't have robbed the bank. You're going to jail. And maybe next time you won't. But even if you don't learn, that's your punishment. Why doesn't that apply to government? Right. I mean, why is he not? Uh, why doesn't he want to punish? He doesn't want to punish because I think he's uh, afraid of the backlash he's going to get from uh, Republicans and from conservative conservative Americans, who are all in favor of uh, protecting government workers uh, who who were engaged in in, uh, in torture. 
you know, if you look at what, what's happened after that torture report came out, there was, uh, they did polls, and 51% uh, of the American public uh, were in favor of the government doing that. I mean, 51%. It's crazy. It's crazy. So it's politically correct not to prosecute them if more than a majority of the country are, are uh, uh, not against what they did. But it's morally wrong. Of course it's morally. It's horrible. It's morally absurd. So, um, <laughs> I mean, you're asking me to explain the inexplicable. Except but, in terms of politics. I mean, politics is the answer to everything. That's why people, that's why politicians do these things, because they don't want people to be angry at them. So, uh, if you look at the polls, the majority of people will be angry at you if you take action against the... People committed terrorists, uh, committed uh, torture. So, so the politically smart thing, not the not the morally correct, but the politically smart thing is to uh, ignore it. That was Obama's policy when he came into office. Ignore what they did. He ignored the uh, the violations of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, the eavesdropping. He ignored all that. Ignorance is bliss. I ignorance is not only bliss. Ignorance is votes to a large degree. <laughs> Um, so that's how politicians think. But I mean, so politicians are okay with torture, with total surveillance, just to not make the uh, voters angry. Exactly. What else uh, can you... There, there is no other explanation for that, except that um, you'd prefer not having people angry at you for your policies. And if you start bringing former presidents and vice presidents and directors of NSA and directors of CIA and putting them, uh, bringing them to trial, you're going to have a lot of people that are going to say you're un-American and you're, uh, uh, these people were just trying to protect us and all this other stuff. So it's easier just to say, well, we're just going to move forward. I mean, they didn't, they didn't do that in South Africa. They had truth and reconciliation hearings they've they've had those other places same with east germany we we, we had a, like we created an institution that uh you're still able to look up what, what the stasi uh did to you exactly yeah i uh, i was in berlin last uh last summer and i uh, took a tour through the old stasi headquarters even uh snuck under the little uh barrier there and sat in the old stasi chief's desk just to see what it was like <laughs> uh how was it like Well, I could see where he would have feeling of power in there, yes. <laughs> um, and, uh, and that's the problem, is that the, uh, uh, the people who are in power want to stay in power. And the way you stay in power, at least in the United States and a lot of other places, is by um, uh, not doing things that are going to force people to uh, vote against you. So they, um, so they let people off. Uh, I mean, it goes all the way back to Nixon. Nixon committed all kinds of crimes, but was never p punished. It was given a pardon by Jerry Ford. Um, so, uh, in very rare cases, do, do politicians ever um, uh, want to prosecute other government officials? It's just, it, it, there, it's much easier just to brush it under the rug. So you're saying politicians do stuff to stay in power. Um, maybe America as a whole does does things to stay in power because I mean they are still the superpower uh, on the planet. Uh, is that why they do more shit than any other country? Well, yeah, it's a psychological thing where even though we're we're the world's really only superpower right now. Um, And, you know, we're not really worried about the Russian firing nuclear missiles at us and the Chinese are more interested in our economy than taking, a, uh, taking over the U.S. militarily. It doesn't stop the, uh, the conservatives and the far right and all that from constantly pushing for more money for the Pentagon. You know, how many trillions can you put into the, tr uh, into the Pentagon? And then, uh, because it's good for the economy, because the money that goes in there 
goes out to all these companies and their constituent, uh, their uh, their states and their their um, uh, their districts, uh, Booz Allen, um, Boeing, uh, all these companies. They employ people in the defense uh, industry, so it's this it's this crazy world where we keep hyping up the threats and the terror terror mongering um, for equal, for full employment, basically building things that are totally useless, ships that will never be used, or or uh, weapons that will never be used, just for the sake of keeping us strong, as they say, keeping the American Empire intact? Well, of course, yeah. I mean, the American Empire. Um, look at where we have bases all over the world now. We're, how many other countries are launching wars every couple of years? Uh, you know, um, uh, you know, how many other countries? You know, we keep criticizing Iran. How many countries has Iran ever attacked? None. Um, but uh, the United States manages to attack um, we just managed to have endless war. That's the whole point. Ever since 9-11, uh, we've been on this track of endless war. The point is to have an endless war? Apparently, because we uh, we never stopped having a war. We started with uh, um, Iraq and then uh, uh, Afghanistan. Um, or maybe it was Afghanistan and Iraq. I can't really remember. <laughs> Afghanistan <laughs> I mean, first. Not, not that it makes any difference. Um, but Iraq was first in the 90s. Yeah, that's and then, true. And then you came back, the sequel. Right. Well, um, at least George Bush Sr. had the sense to sort of stop in Kuwait and not go on to Baghdad. Um, because he knew that if you took out Saddam Hussein, you're going to break up a country um, that is uh, going to lead to just enormous chaos. And that's exactly what's happened now. I mean, now you have the ISIS. You know, ISIS grew out of of uh, Al Qaeda in Iraq. There was no Al Qaeda in Iraq before we invaded Iraq. So we're our own worst enemy. Um, we're now fighting uh, ISIS. Um, and a while back, we were uh, uh, about to launch an attack against uh, 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 President Assad of uh, of of Syria, and now we're sort of supporting President Assad against ISIS, you know, it's really time to let the Middle East sort of solve their own problems and let us cure the world of cancer, Ebola, uh, AIDS, a few other problems. I mean, how many, how many, how many terrorists are going to start blowing up our buildings if we start curing cancer instead of blowing up Middle Eastern countries? So it's time to end the empire. Well, yeah, exactly. And the empire in terms of taking over the, uh, the world and start the new empire of taking over uh, medicine, good things, you know, bringing an end to horrible diseases. We could be an empire for good instead of an empire for bad. Are you in favor of spy agencies, of intelligence agencies? Yeah, I don't have really a big problem with, uh, with intelligence as long as they're focused on on um, you know serious problems around the world, uh, you know, keeping uh, the government up to date on what North Korea might be doing in terms of nuclear weapons or whatever. I mean, that's what spies do. I don't have any problem with that, as long as it as long as it's uh, uh, makes sense. As long as the the spying is um, who, who decides what makes sense. Well, that's what I'm saying. If you got a, a good president, should be able to make those decisions. Decide. You know, it makes more sense to to spy on 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 North Korea than it does to spy on uh, 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 northern New England in the United States. I mean, where where is the danger coming from? It's not coming from Boston. It's coming from uh, from North Korea. So uh, no, I would cut back enormously on the spying. Now I think human spying is almost useless. Um, I mean, look at the human spying in uh, in Iraq. Uh, it was uh, human spies that told us there were all these weapons there, you know. Um, Ahmed Chalabi and all these people. Uh, um, so human spying is useless because they they rely on people who lie a lot and and uh, make things up for their own 
value. The NSA is actually the best organization in terms of spying uh, internationally. I've been writing the about it. Yeah, it is the best. Why? Uh, because if, if you meet somebody in a bar and he tells you that Saddam Hussein has uh, all kinds of weapons of mass destruction, how do you know if he's telling you the truth? He might be making it up like Ahmed Chalabi did. But if you're eavesdropping on their encrypted in communications and you're able to break their encryption, um, what they're saying over that communications is probably true. So if they're saying uh, that they have this new, you know, super uh, uh, powerful H-bomb that has 500 mega, uh, uh, megatons or something, and they're saying it over an encrypted link, the odds are that's probably true. It's, it's far, the odds are far greater than some source you might happen to meet on a, uh, you know, at a party or something. I mean, the CIA sources uh, or somebody that they recruit that might be, a, uh, you know, in it for, for the money. A lot of these people that, that uh, turned up uh, giving all this information about Iraq was do were doing it just so they could get a passport to the United States, so they get it. You know, um, um, uh, I'll tell you all this stuff if you give me citizenship or if you let me come in the U.S. and, you know, give me $100,000 a year or whatever. I'll tell you whatever you want to know. So and that's what's happened. That's what happened. Uh, and, and so as a result, we invaded a country that was never planning to attack us, that never had any weapons of mass destruction. So, I mean, you, you, you said you're okay with uh, intelligence agencies. I mean, now we're at the CCC. I mean, we, we talked to Constanza Kurz. She's the head of the CCC, and she said intelligence agencies are not compatible with democracies. So... Is America not a democracy anymore, or well, do you not agree? Compatible with the democracies. I mean, I, I, I'm not on. Uh, you know, I've been writing about this for a long time. I'm extremely uh, uh, vocal critic of uh, of spying, but I'm not um, a vocal critic of of useful spying. I mean, there's useful spying. We, you know, in World War II, uh, we broke the German Enigma Code, uh, which uh, helped. Uh, end the war quickly. We broke the but, but, the Japanese uh, purple code. But that was that was World War. That's that right. That was the, the the worst war. Of right. I know. Uh, but uh, there still are threats out there. I, I I'm not willing to just completely throw out the the, the towel and do away with that. But, uh, but but won't there always be threats? Yeah. But that's what you need intelligence for. I don't see any reason why we shouldn't have intelligence trying to. Tell us what's going on in uh, in uh, potential countries that are potential threats, uh, but there's a, a enormous difference between that and uh, spying on innocent Germans or spying on innocent Americans or spying on Angela Merkel or spying on uh, on uh, 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 world leaders who pose no threats spying on the uh, leader of North Korea, I don't see any problem with it. Do you have a problem with the NSA spying on Barack Obama? Do, 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 you, do you think the NSA or any... They would give me that intelligence, I wouldn't have any problem with it, no. Uh, but, no, I don't think the spy agency should be spying on, on Americans, period. It makes no sense. That's not what they're created for. They weren't created to spy on, on the U.S. Just like the Army wasn't created to keep peace in the United States. The Air Force isn't, wasn't created to patrol the, the skies of the United States. And the NSA wasn't created to eavesdrop on Americans. And the CIA wasn't created to, to send spies around the U.S. All these were meant to face outward, to... Um, you know, to uh, um, defend the United States from foreign forces. The problem is after 9-11, because 9-11 happened uh, by terrorists who were living in the United States for a number of years, that's given all these, uh, that's allowed the American public to largely say, okay, now it's okay, you can spy in the U.S. because these terrorists were in the United States. So, um, I mean, that's why all this happened. But I, I've never, I've been writing about this all along. I wrote a book all about how we got into the war in Iraq. It's, um, 
it's senseless to, to spy on American citizens because um, uh, where do you start? I mean, it's 300 million people. You listen to every single phone conversation, pick up every single metadata. It just doesn't make any sense. But, but it's also senseless to spy on Germans. Well, I think it is, yeah. I think it's useless to spy on anybody who's not a threat. Well, maybe we are a threat and we don't know it yet. Well, maybe you are, but uh, that doesn't justify spying on, uh, on uh, wasting money spying on people who, who are allies. It doesn't make any sense. But, but, but is it a waste of money if it's um, almost, if it, if it doesn't cost anything, if, uh, I mean, maybe, yes. they, maybe, maybe just want, they just want to surveil Russia and then it's like, oh, Germany is a freebie, so we're just going to uh, do Germany too. No, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense to spy on innocent uh, Russians either. What it makes sense is spying on the Russian military. You know, the, it, it's not really that hard uh, to separate that. The military have their own communications. They have their own communications links. Those are the ones you can spy on. It, 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 to try to spy on everybody, you're, you're um, completely diluting any kind of analysis. You can't analyze millions and millions of communications, but you can analyze, um, you know, thousands of communications that come out from, um, you know, a military or whatever. I have no problem spying on a on, on a military in a country that uh, may be a potential threat. So, in in the end, uh, what needs to happen that? spy agencies and politicians get that message to just only spy on like the military of other nations um, yeah, you know I really wish I had that answer what what really has to happen is you have to have a, a president that comes in that says look folks we've been doing a lot of things that are not good that waste a lot of money and that um, Uh, we've got to really change. I mean, we've been going down and down and down. Uh, world opinion, wasting a lot of money, we're spending money. In other words, have a president come in and level with people and tell them the truth about what's been going on and, uh, and say, you know, this may be my only term as president, but that's, you know, that's life. Uh, is that realistic? I mean, Hillary Clinton is no. the for forerunner. She doesn't... I don't. I, I don't think she's going to be something, someone like She'll that. She'll be. She's giving every indication of being a neocon. A, you know. Um, uh, uh, What's a neocon? A neocon is one of these people who. Uh, 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 it, it was pretty much the neocons who got us into the uh, war in Iraq. It was the people who, who are always so afraid of the um, of what the. Uh, uh, Muslims are doing and the Arab states are doing and we've got to do everything to protect ourselves and it's this Islamophobia and uh, and, and it's this uh, warmongering and, and um, that's pretty much um, uh, the common denominators for for um, uh, neocons and, and uh, I mean I look at Hillary Clinton and I don't see um, anything progressive ab about her Her policies are just the same as Barack Obama, if not further to the right. And I think that's her idea. I think she puts her finger up to the wind. The wind is blowing to the right. You can see that in the last election. Um, you know, you had two people there in Congress, in the Senate, who were pushing very, very hard for um, answers about what NSA's been doing. Um, just, two. Senator, just two, Senator Wyden and Senator Udall. Um, I'm talking pre-Snowden. Um, and then, uh, you know, they should have been championed as heroes after Snowden, saying everything they've been saying is right. You know, and so what happens? I mean, uh, uh, Senator Udall loses his seat. I mean, he gets, he gets basically kicked out of office for being right. And, and, uh, and a more conservative person comes in. And then you have the Senate... You have the whole Congress turning further right, more conservatives, more Republicans. So what sense does that make? Uh, so if you're Hillary Clinton, you're looking at that and you're going to think, hmm, should I go to the left or should I go to the right? Uh, well, obviously she's going to say, 
I should be going to the right because that's the way the wind's blowing. So. Uh, and final question: Do you think we, we, uh, the CCC should invite Hillary Clinton next year to maybe, uh, maybe not give a talk, but actually listen to what's being said? Uh, do, do, yes. Do, do, do you think she understands what's going on? Oh, I think she understands. She's been, you know, she was a first lady for eight years. She was in politics ever since she got out of college. Um, she knows what's going on. Uh, you know, she was fairly pro-Palestinian uh, before uh, 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 her husband was elected president. Then all of a sudden she becomes uh, elected senator from New York. Um, and all of a sudden now she's this, uh, you know, huge pro-Israeli supporter and everything. So she's a woman who uh, wants to rise up in politics and will do whatever the uh, uh, whatever is politically demanded of her. She sounds a little bit like Angela Merkel. Angela Merkel always waits um, where the wind blows and uh, and then decides to go with that. Well, so you she, probably so know she more can, about so Angela she can, Merkel so, than I. So she can stay in power. Right. Well, that's that's not just Angela Merkel. That's politicians. It's Tony Blair. It's it, you name it. Um, you know, people thought Tony Blair was going to be very enlightened. What's he? What did he do? He became a you know a poodle of uh, George Bush. Um, so. Um, uh, so do we need to change politics itself? Well, the politics, rules of politics. Yeah. Right. I mean, the you know the definition of politics is that in in a sense the public. I mean. It's, Politicians are elected by the public, so you have to go to the grassroots. I'm always complaining in the United States because um, the public is so um, uh, anemic. It's uh, uh, you have so much apathy in the public. I grew up in the '60s, and, and uh, you know, as part of the anti-war movement, we had uh, pro-civil rights movements. We had all these movements. We got rid of Uh, President Richard Nixon, you know, we, we ended a war, uh, Vietnam War by protest and so forth. And now, you know, you don't get that. You don't get this, you don't get the sense of, uh, of, of involvement. And I think that's one of the, the key problems is uh, we did away with the draft. I think you need the draft. And you need the draft because um, what do you have now? You have people that... Uh, uh, um, go into the military and they come from, a lot of them come from rural states and rural areas and, you know, they join. So you've got uh, maybe 150,000 families in, in the United States, only 150,000, that have any stake in that, any, any stake whatsoever in the war. The others don't. They don't have any stake. I mean, when I went in. So uh, they don't care? No, they don't care. They don't care. They they'll buy into whatever the government's saying, uh, and um, and and let these other people go fight, um, who are volunteering. And uh, it's not the way it should be. It should be if you go to war and you're a democracy, everybody should um, play a role, just like everybody has to pay taxes. It's not just uh, you know we'll, we'll let some people pay taxes, other people don't have to. Everybody should have to go into a war. Not just to make it fair. But um, so that you have a sense of a war. Um, if, you, if we had the draft, we never would have been in the war in Iraq because little Johnny off to Harvard next year is going to Afghanistan instead. I mean, if you had a, a real draft where everybody, you know, no college deferments or anything. I mean, I got number one on the draft in the United States. Uh, I won the lottery, you know. Uh, Congratulations. Yeah, it's not exactly winning. It's the only thing I ever won in my life. But yeah, the, they they had a draft, you know, a draft lottery, and they put their hand in the bowl, and I got number one. So, what, what, what happened afterwards? Well, I did you go? I was afraid of. I didn't. I never had really good luck, so I was very afraid of that. So before they put their hand in the <laughs> jar, I I joined, because if you join, um, so I joined and uh, I joined the Navy. You know, the Navy is fairly. You got you got some water between you and the bad guys a lot of times, <laughs> so I ended up in Hawaii for three years. You know, Whoa. dodging surfboards. How, how about that? That was great. Yeah, I loved it. <laughs> uh, but had I not, I would have been on the first plane going to Vietnam. Uh, so, uh, you know, I lucked out. But uh, you know, a lot of people didn't. Um, 
so I did three years in the Navy and, and uh, I live to tell about it. Uh, and, and, and another final thought. I mean, you mentioned the 60s with the, with the movements, uh, civil rights and uh, the war. I mean, people could see victims uh, uh, because of what's been happening. I mean, there were, there were uh, uh, the black uh, minority, they were vict victimized. Uh, the people uh, in Vietnam, they were, they, were, they were victims. Maybe now with surveillance and all that, maybe people just don't see where the victims are. Maybe they can't, well, they can't identify with anybody. Well, exactly. I mean, the two big things in Vietnam was every family, I mean, with some exceptions, uh, the majority of families in the United States all were at risk because their kids could be, were drafted. Everybody had to be uh, sent up for the draft. And a lot of people had no idea they'd ever be in Vietnam were over there. So you had a lot of people that um, um, were against the war because they may be part of it when they wanted nothing to do with it. And the second thing was it was very visual. Uh, you had reporters over there with cameras in the jungle showing people getting blown up. Now with these kind of wars, with uh, war, drone wars, all you see are these, um, these sort of black and white Uh, 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 silent videos of, of uh, now you see it, now you don't. This, uh, this building is here, and then it's gone. Okay, so what? But you don't see the bodies. That was one of the things that drove uh, uh, Chelsea Manning to become a whistleblower. He actually saw the bodies. I mean, what drove him was, originally was uh, seeing this uh, helicopter machine gunning uh, people uh, who were Uh, ostensibly civilians. I mean, they, were, they showed no indication of being uh, hostile. And, and, and so that drove him. And that's the problem, where you don't actually see the blood, where you don't actually see the bodies. Um, there is no war. And that's the problem here. You've got no involvement because it's just kids from Kentucky or, you know, some uh, rural place maybe, or somebody that they have no connection to who are joining and fighting. And number two, It's a war in a place they don't care about, and all they're seeing are these black and white images of uh, puffs of smoke, and that's all. How, how do we make the public see the victims of uh, surveillance, of I mean, I mean, even American surveillance? Or is it is it just not not? Uh... It's very difficult because uh, you have journalists. The journalists in Vietnam were 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 reporting right alongside the, uh, the, um, uh, the soldiers. You're not doing that in the, in the United States. You don't have journalists sitting next to the drone pilots. <laughs> and uh, there, there's, not, uh, there's not journalists on the ground because they have no idea where the, where the next uh, 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 Hellfire missile is going to be shot. So, and by the time they get there, the bodies are gone. They're buried weeks ago or days ago. So it's, it's an entirely different um, type of a war. You, you, those are the two things that are missing from this one, the, the involvement of, uh, of every American and the, uh, the, the visual evidence of what we're doing. Thanks so much, James. My pleasure. Are you, are you on Twitter or something? Or yeah. Do you have a website? Um, I don't have a website, but I'm on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, Twitter is a wash author, W-A-S-H. Um, a U T H O R, um, and uh, I'm at uh, Facebook at uh, um, uh, Wash, like Washington Wash Writer, W R I T E R W A S H W R I T E R at Gmail dot com. Thank you so much. We are on Twitter as well at Young and Naive and at Tilo Jung, and um, also on Facebook. So follow us, find us. Bye bye. Thanks very much. Bye bye.